Welcome to today's GNCC uh, special webinar focused on Niagara Region's 10-year economic development strategy, which outlines directions, goals, and actions that will guide staff as they collaborate with partners on its implementation. Economic development is not only about transforming and growing industries, but in essence, it's about transforming lives. And this is well captured in the bold vision set out in the 10-year plan. And it goes as such, Niagara, where innovative businesses grow and community-minded individuals stay, coming together to build a more prosperous future. It speaks to the inherent link between economic growth and economic and social well-being. So to all of our participants today, I'm thankful that you are able to join us. And to our guests, thank you for being with us, with us to take a closer look at the strategies to create prosperity. And with us today is George Spencer, who is the Director of Economic Development for the region for nearly two years, and Marco Marmino in this new role as Associate Director of Economic Development at the region, and known to many of you uh, in his previous roles with the City of Thorold, as well as with the City of St. Catharines. My name is Mishka Balsam, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. I thought I'd start out by looking at today's format. I'm going to pass the mic actually over to both George and Marco for probably the first 20 to 30 minutes, as they will provide actually an overview of the strategic plan that is actually that we have shared and that we also will make available during this webinar. But many of you have also asked questions and those questions we have to all taken into consideration and we are hoping to have a very interactive format, especially in the second half of the webinar, where we really are committed to getting to all of your questions. Now, I have to say that I believe that everyone is a pro at Zoom these days. But just a quick reminder, uh, if you wish to ask a question, uh, please utilize the hand uh, screen, the symbol of the hand. And by clicking so, uh, it indicates to us that we will unmute you that you want to ask a question. The second option is also the chat function. It's a field where you can type in your questions. We can see it on our end and we'll do our best to get to all the questions that are there. If you wish to enable live transcript, please refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen for that option. And lastly, I just wanted to let everyone know that today's session is recorded and will be made available on our website at gncc.ca as well as to all the individuals who've signed up for today's webinar. And on that note, I'm going to pass it over to you, gentlemen. Well, good uh, good morning, Mishka, and good morning to uh, to all of the participants. Um, thank you very much for having us. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here to talk a little bit about our economic ten year economic development strategy, which was uh, approved by regional council uh, in June. Uh, it's an exciting time here for uh, economic development and, and for the region, um, having a 10-year plan as a, as a horizon um, to shape Niagara's economy over the next 10 years is really important. Uh, I think it's a very important document, and, um, and uh, we, we look forward to, to, implementing, uh, to implementing the plan over the next 10 years. Um, the plan itself was... Uh, was um, uh, a, a real excellent collaboration uh, with the local area municipalities. Um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Mishka Marco was the uh, uh, chair of our advisory uh, committee uh, that included members of economic development uh, from all the uh, eight municipalities uh, that he have economic development functions, uh, but included representation from all 12 municipalities uh, with one of our internal staff members that also represents um, and, and uh, works with the local area municipalities that don't have the economic development function, uh, was part of the committee as well. Our commissioner of planning, um, Michelle, Michelle Sergi, was also part of the advisory committee. And so I think, uh, I think overall, an excellent collaboration with all the local area municipalities to put together this plan. It was, uh, it was adopted by regional council unanimously, and uh, we're really excited about what the future holds for Niagara and how we can move forward in implementing our plan. Thank you very much. Um, 
And I'm just wondering if uh, Marco wants to come in at this point too. Sure, if I could just compliment to what George has already stated. I mean, the, the biggest, I think the biggest point that needs to be emphasized is that moving forward, collaboration is going to be key. We've seen through COVID-19 and, and, and these, in these other types of events, like the war that's happening in the Ukraine right now, that it's had a tremendous impact globally and obviously regionally and at a municipal level. So the more that we can leverage those relationships that we already have at the local level and the regional level to work towards establishing you know, lobbying efforts at the provincial and federal levels for things that we're going to need in the future by way of policy development that's going to be reflective of you know, where business is going and how we need to react, that's going to be key for us. So I just, I just look forward to that collaboration because it's already very evident I think it's one of the best teams this region has ever seen, to be quite honest with you, in my 22 years of having been doing economic development at Thorold or at St. Catharines, now at the regional level, which I'm looking forward to, is going to be uh, not only a challenging time for us, but I think uh, a very, a very, very interesting opportunity for us to showcase why Niagara is a global player and, and, and why we can be a global player. So I'm looking forward to that opportunity through the implementation plan, but also in having conversations with key people within industry and also key people at the, you know, the residential level as well. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. It's really appreciated. And I really uh, appreciate both of you for your introductory comments that you've made. Um, I was wondering, um, there's two ways that we can move forward. We can go directly into the questions or if you wish to actually provide more high level Kind of focus on it uh, and an overview we can also move forward like that uh george do you what format do you i i think i think it's fine we should i think we can just go right into the questions and uh i think probably cover much of the material that the that the plan offers through some of the questions and uh fireside chat that sounds wonderful actually well george i'm going to start out with you because um the last couple of years we have all looked at our strategic plans we have adjusted them and changed them and there has been a lot of questions around how long should a strategic plan be is two years right four years right in this particular case you and uh you um the advisory group that you have worked with had looked at a 10-year plan um, and we were wondering, and some of the questions have come forward, is this specifically tied to a business cycle or is it driven by external uh, factors, but it's the sense of what drove that 10 year period of time? Sure. No, a great question. And the 10 year period essentially comes from a direction from regional council. Uh, in fact, uh, regional council had asked economic development to look at a, a, a long term plan. Uh, and specifically a 10-year plan that really mapped out the direction for the region, looking strategically, looking forward um, about what the 10-year horizon uh, could look like for Niagara. So um, the, the, the 10 years actually comes from, from a mandate from Regional Council, and we delivered on that mandate. Uh, but we fully recognize that um, 10 years is a long time, in particular in business cycles and economic cycles. Um, so the, the plan... Um, you know, identifies a number of strategic areas that we want to um, participate in as economic development, but um, also as we influence other areas, policy direction within the region, such as uh, we may not have the direct involvement in economic development, but issues such as affordable housing and healthcare and those things, you know, are all part of a, a longer term strategy. We, we expect to have a role in economic development maybe not be the lead role on those areas, but that's the, the vision of, of the 10-year plan because there's some high level uh, issues that I think need to be identified. As I said, we fully recognize that um, business cycles are usually three to five years. Economic conditions can change things. And the plan is really designed to be iterative. It's designed to be flexible. And so we can pivot at any time if we need to. Um, you know, last two years, as we've seen, we've had an economic crisis with the pandemic. You know, we, we understand that these types of things can happen and we're prepared um, as a region in economic development to make sure that we can be flexible to react to economic conditions and business cycles. So um, uh, we, we look forward to, you know, moving ahead with the plan. 
but also uh, being able to pivot when necessary. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, it's very interesting. It's, uh, as you said, most to look at a three to five year cycle. And then I think, uh, especially economic development department, I think there's always a challenge too that we have elections in between. So some of the directions might also change at, at the same time, uh, which can be a challenge and a great opportunity uh, when we move forward uh, at the same time. You mentioned uh, in your plan elements that speak to the forecasted population growth uh, and the requirements uh, that are needed when it comes to housing. And especially we've had a lot of conversations already when it comes also to employment lands. And um, I thought maybe just when we look at it from a perspective and saying historically, our population has grown slowly here in Niagara. But in 2021, this year by year end, we have a forecast of 490,000. And then if we look forward, say like 20 years from now, we are looking at 610,000, which is a 25% increase. And if you look further down the road, uh, 30 years, so to the year uh, 2051, uh, it's 674, which is a significant increase in population that alone actually indicates uh, that the province is expecting our region's population to grow by just under 40% within the next 30 years. And then at the same time, if we look at the benchmark housing prices, we look in 2017, just barely five years ago, the average house in Naga was around 370,000. Now we're looking at a 76% increase of 650,000 not taking into consideration the prices that we have seen this year alone, which are higher than that. This, these are challenges that are there. They're challenges for individuals who live in this community, who've known this community to not grow to that significant amount of um, population, has not seen the growth. And it's a challenge when it comes to the housing, and it's a challenge when it comes to employment land. George, how do we move forward? How do we take this into consideration and making it right? Because we are, we, it represents economic opportunities, which we can see, but in your vision, which you mentioned, or which I mentioned up front, it's also the social well-being that we need to consider at the same time. How do you merge them together? How do you bring them together? And what is the role of your department? Yeah, so you, you're absolutely right. I mean, our, our, our population in, in, in Niagara has grown over the last five years, actually by 6.7%. So we've had like over 30,000 people over the last, uh, grew over, over the last five years. Um, the interesting thing is, is that housing hasn't grown to the same pace. So the population has grown more than the housing has, uh, has, has, uh, has been able to catch up. So you're absolutely right. And by 2041, as, you, as indicated, you know, over 610,000, almost 611,000 people uh, we expect to be having in, in the region. So huge increases in population growth. With that population growth comes challenges like any, any community. Um, you know, you, you have the issues of affordable housing, you have issues of health care, et cetera. And I think what's important for us moving forward and the role that economic development um, can play at the region is really being part of those discussions that influence policy decisions, um, having that economic development lens as part of those discussions. Look, we, we want a healthy, dynamic, vibrant region for people to live, work, and play. Um, and I think we're gonna have to be sort of, you know, creative and very strategic on how the population grows. How do we preserve our employment lands? You know, we, we, we want a community that people can live in, can enjoy, can thrive. And that means having good businesses, good employment lands, protecting and preserving our employment lands so we can attract, uh, you know, so we can, we can support our existing businesses, right? For, who provide excellent uh, jobs to the community. Uh, but also uh, we wanna be in a position where, you know, uh, expanding those employment lands and protecting those employment lands allows us the ability uh, to attract new investment and grow the employment uh, and, and create jobs in the region as well. Because at the end of the day, Mishka, we, we don't just want people living in our region. We don't want it to be a bedroom community. We want people to live, we want people to work and we want people to thrive in our region. And it's an important component of being able to keep our youth, uh, you know, the youth uh, as they graduate out of university with great skills, 
Some will have, you know, some may have to move or have had to move in the past outside of the region for job for job opportunities. We want to keep that talent base. We want to keep the youth in the region. So uh, it's important for us to to ensure as economic development that we're helping to provide the investment, the creating the investment and creating some of those jobs uh, so people can continue to thrive in the region. Uh, we want them to live there, work there, and uh, and really enjoy the benefits of being part of an amazing region. You touched on that important point, and you mentioned that we don't just want to be a bedroom community. When we have we have business people, engaged business people who are listening to this webinar, uh, they want to be prepared, so they're looking at that population growth as being hopefully or potentially also being an opportunity for them. When you look at that population growth that's there, can you define it a bit more uh, in detail and saying like, are we looking for a certain age group? Are we looking for diversity? Where are we, how are we attracting it? And what do we think it will look like in 20 years from now? Because Naga, as you said, has often, when we look right. at it, when we see our neighborhoods changing, we think it becomes this bedroom community. Um, and our, in the average age of Americans is higher than what we see in many other regions that are there, which has its advantages, its opportunities, but also its challenges uh, at the same time. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. So the, the you know, on average, our data shows that our, our, our demographics and our population is on the, uh, you know, older side of the, uh, in the region in comparison to other regions across Ontario. But that could be a good thing. We're seeing people um, in, as older demographics uh, are retiring later. Um, they bring a wealth of experience uh, to the labor force. Um, people are generally, you know, want to continue to work and, and be and, uh, and, and are health, having healthier lifestyles that allow them to work and stay in the workforce. That in itself can be an advantage for, for Niagara in keeping and utilizing the experience and expertise and the skill levels that we have in a mature population. Now, before the pandemic, we actually started to see that growth coming out of the, uh, you know, the, the, the GTA region. I believe also the pandemic that has helped to accelerate that growth. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is, you know, hybrid work environments, remote work environments, as we're seeing now, you know, people's views of work has changed. And so we're, we're seeing that uh, people are saying, look, if I'm gonna, if I have an opportunity to work, you know, work remotely, um, and I can um, live in a community that offers the quality of life that I'm looking for, that offers potentially uh, more affordability in terms of space for housing. So we're starting to see that talent, some of that talent pool and the younger talent pool um, uh, from the GTA coming to the region who are able to, um, were able to, to uh, you know, to settle in the region, be able to work, work remotely, perhaps go back and forth on their work environments. So we're seeing it on both ends. And I think that that could be an opportunity for our local businesses, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, uh, certainly challenges on <clears throat> supply chain disruptions, but also a shortage of labor supply. One of the things we hear very much from our business community, and I'm sure you hear it as well, Mishka, and the manufacturing side is, you know, it is difficult. Uh, to find people to employ, to have the skills that they need uh, uh, in, in their, in the, in, in, for their employers. Um, so these are all areas where I think, you know, the, 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 the opportunity to have a more mature labor force, keeping them in the labor force, getting women back into the, in, into the labor force. We saw many of the women population in the region that exited the labor force uh, during the pandemic are right re-entering that um, and, 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 and trying to keep the youth and utilize the opportunity for uh, youth population that's coming out of the G and, and just general, you know, general population that is moving uh, into the region. So these can all be opportunities for businesses to uh, access more labor. <clears throat> Yeah, you're actually absolutely right. It doesn't matter which organization, which business we talk to, uh, to uh, the labor challenge is the number one challenge right now. And we held, when we held our NAC Economic Summit in the fall of last year, and we had asked a number of economists to comment on it too. And it was interesting that um, they said it's here to stay for about a 10 year period of time. There's no quick fixes to it. Um, and it's really something that we need to look at significantly differently than what we've done. And it's 
every sector of it. You're looking at food service, you're looking at accommodation, you're looking at construction, you're looking at wholesale. It doesn't matter where it is, if you're looking at in healthcare, education, you see it everywhere. So it's really an issue that um, I really think we need to come together as a community to look at where the opportunities are. And and Mishka, Mishka, I'll add to that as well, is that it's not, it's not uh, an issue that's just regionally focused right? across the country, right? Across the province, everyone's experiencing those labor shortages and, and, and that's a challenge. So we're not unique in Niagara where it's a challenge for us. It's really across the board. Yeah, and it's actually interesting. It's actually also something that a lot of European countries experience too. So yes. it has an international aspect to it too, where really we have seen some significant changes. And we're looking at, we often have had these conversations to saying like, how will the last two years kind of shape us um, and shape individuals? And I think this is a this is a huge aspect of it. But uh, let me, Marco, I would love to bring you in. And it's uh, as a follow up to one of the things that George had mentioned when we talked a little bit about employment land. And one of the questions that um, one of our participants had is how do you measure Naga's investment readiness compared to nearby regions? Um, and I know that serviced industrial land could be one aspect of it, but I think it's an interesting perspective because we often don't know, are we ready for it? Are we ready for the investment that we need? What are some of the areas maybe where we could focus on to see some growth? Sure, it's a great question. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we are very investment ready. It also depends on the ask of each individual business. I mean, obviously, you know, what the ask is going to be from somebody that's in clean tech industry versus let's say, you know, your traditional manufacturing industry to somebody that's, you know, you know, in, uh, in you know, finance or whatever the case may be is going to be different. So what we as economic developers need to do is obviously tell that story that meets the criteria and speak to their ask. So it, it's about us understanding what assets are already in place that we can then identify for them if they don't have a familiarity with the area at this point in time. And even if they do, we sometimes tend to surprise them with a lot of the material and a lot of the information that we do have and the relationships that we can, that we can build upon. I mean, being a part of, let's say, you know, the GNCC, the Niagara Industrial Association, having your connections to Innovate Niagara, the Vineland Research and Innovation Center, the Walker Advanced Manufacturing and Innovation Center, all these different groups bring a different set of skill sets and different sets of information to the table, as well as your Niagara College and your Brock University or post-secondary institutions, which can tailor certain programming to specific types of business requirements. We can then be that conduit and make those connections to those individual organizations in order to help alleviate some of the stresses that they may have throughout their business planning processes in making a certain decision as to whether or not they want to make that investment. So I think that's a very important aspect that we need to focus on is understanding what is that unique ask that each of those individual businesses have, and then tailoring our answers and, and our response to them in a way that showcases that we are ready for their investment. And we truly are in a sense from an industrial perspective, I think there are still, you know, we have staff already at the regional level that are actually mapping out specific investment ready sites. Uh, we're working with provincial colleagues on that as well. And then we're also outlining what the capacity is at those sites, whether there's capacity or other additional capacity as well. So again, Mishka, I think it really comes down to what's the individual ask. Every single ask will be unique. And then we will then tailor our response to each of those asks that we receive. Thank you very much. And on that note, because I want to come back to your plan, but maybe, George, if I can bring you in for a quick second, Marco, I'll come right back to you. But George, in your plan, you speak also about sector development. Marco just mentioned it as well, uh, this really tailored approach to where we want to go and who we can attract, all in an effort to create a more resilient and diverse economy uh, for Niagara. Traditionally, Naga's strength um, to the outside world has been in tourism, agri-food, and those areas supported by retail and wholesale. Um, but we also know that the, uh, manufacturing, our logistics, and other areas have actually also played a big factor. And I'm leaving out healthcare and other services. I'm really just focusing on, on sectors where we can actually make an impact. 
when you look at diversifying our economy further to attract different sectors, again, for the purpose of creating more resiliency in our economy, are there opportunities when we look at technology or financial services? We are celebrating Canada Games, sports, tourism, an opportunity. Does the marine sector, in light of our physical location, present an opportunity? Where do you see the growth areas? And again, these are the questions that are of interest to the business community and of interest to entrepreneurs <laughs> who want to also say we can move forward here um, and um, they can bring forward the ideas to then leverage them. Well, so, so yes, absolutely. I mean, th this was a key element that I wanted to see in our economic development strategy, you know, moving forward. Um, you know, the health and well-being of any economy, you know, its strength is basically being able to have diversification. And, and as you mentioned, Mishka, you know, Niagara has always been well known and will continue to be well known for our strength in tourism, uh, tourism and hospitality. Our manufacturing community is very healthy, very strong, is very robust, even during the during the pandemic for two years is one of, you know, actually saw some growth in our manufacturing. It they really stepped up and really um, were, were, were strong and were resilient during the pandemic. And of course, our, our agricultural sector, these three sectors will continue to be strong. We wanna to continue to grow these sectors, these sectors, and they're incredibly valuable to the region in terms of the jobs that they create and the value of investment that they bring to the region. However, I do believe it's very important for us to have that diversification. The plan identifies a number of emerging sectors that we're seeing in the economy uh, that will be beneficial, beneficial for us to explore further, to be, able to, um, um, to be able to grow those emerging sectors. So we create some of, that, um, um, so some of that diversity in the economy. So we can weather potential economic crises that happen. We were one of the regions in, in, in Ontario that were more significant, significantly impacted by the pandemic because of our strong tourism sector. That sector was hit pretty dramatically. And so we, you know, we, we were, we were in, in the region, uh, one of the worst regions in Ontario in terms of uh, our ability uh, to weather that storm because we're, we're heavily dependent on tourism. Now, that is all coming back. I think we're seeing some of that coming back and that those are good signals sort of post as we come out of the pandemic here, we're seeing a, an increase in activity in the tourism sector and manufacturing and uh, agri-food, agriculture was continued to be strong even during the pandemic. However, the emerging sectors we identified, and this was very important, was healthcare. We're building new hospitals. We wanna become more of a center of excellence around healthcare, life sciences in, in the region. I think that's an important industry. We're seeing a lot of activity coming out of the electric vehicle manufacturing, electric battery manufacturing facilities. As you see, the province of Ontario, the federal government, all investing heavily uh, with OEMs, with electrification of vehicles. We are responding to some significant inquiries around electric battery manufacturing facilities here. We, we offer a great strategic advantage in terms of our proximity to power source. Uh, and also our proximity to the OEMs uh, across across the province. So uh, we're working on that. That's that's going to be another emerging sector that we want to focus on. Uh, we're starting to see some robust interest in film, film and television, and filming industry uh, in 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 the region. So again, another one. Marco, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the marine sector. But our marine and our accessibility, the St. Lawrence Seaway through the canal. Yeah, presents huge opportunities for any company looking to export their products <clears throat> anywhere in the world. Um, so, you know, I, I would say the active economy is another one that we've identified. These are all sectors that we want to build, Mishka, moving forward within that time period. We've actually are going to have a deeper dive uh, into those particular sectors to identify what are the priorities, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, perhaps but also really um, to give us an indication of where, um, <clears throat> where are the opportunities in those emerging sectors. And down the road, the hope will be to have more identified resources to be able to build and grow those emerging sectors. All with keeping also supporting our, our, our strong three main sectors that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. 
And you know what, I think it's a, it's a perfect time actually to bring in uh, some of our participants and what they have actually asked. And I'm actually going to start out, um, Marco, I'm going to bring this over to you, but George, I'm going to come back to the new sectors or the growing opportunities that we have. But Marco, we have Martin and Talbot Niagara College with us. And you have uh, both identified in the past the strengths of a post-secondary Brock University in Niagara College. And both of you have partnerships um, with those two institutions and especially also the people behind it and the students that are there. How can they, so Mark is asking this great question and saying, how can they collaborate with you, with your department to achieve your plan that you have, the one that you have forward? Do you see their role as it historically has been, which I think has been a very good working relationship, or do you see new opportunities there too? I think we're actually just to answer my Mark is obviously a fantastic uh, you know person in the region that has his uh, that has his you know his hand on the pulse of everything and it's been fantastic working with him in partnership through the Walker Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Center. I was the past vice chair there and was very I very much uh, continued to promote uh, what they do there and 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 their agricultural and innovation center is another. Uh, fantastic partnership that we have as well where we've actually supported through through funding uh, for infrastructure and programming what what I would like to say to Mark is that we're looking to continue those partnerships and looking to establish new opportunities as well through the plan we know that things are going to change over time we know that there are certain partnerships that are coming to the end of their life and their agreements at this point in time however that doesn't mean that we can't look to new agreements in the future and new opportunities to collaborate uh, at the end of the day, we know how important our post-secondary institutions are to growing the economic base, to attracting youth, to uh, educating youth and bringing them the skill sets that they require to achieve certain results in the workforce. So the more we tailor ourselves and our plan around what our abilities are at those post-secondary levels, then I think we're, we'll be much better positioned to be able to complement the needs of industry as we move forward. And on the same note of post-secondary, one of the things that we see in Canada that we lack behind research and development funding, uh, we don't do enough of it uh, in comparison with other countries internationally. Um, we, we are not giving the same investment and not moving forward at the same speed. So the question here is also has come forward is how will the Niagara region and the new plan support and leverage applied research for products, processes and services um, to develop those industries, George, that you have spoken about in collaboration like with Niagara College, for example, or with Brock University for economic development purposes. Do we see that there's an opportunity here, maybe where we can go a step further than what we have done in the past? Yeah, and, and I think it's really important. I, I mean, you know, we, both, both of the college and university are a key part of our, um, uh, of our region. Producing the talent that comes from 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 both those of those both of those institutions um, is critical to supplying the labor force required for our community and our business community. Right. So, um, I think you know we we need to um, we need to have that collaboration. We need to understand um, you know what the what what is the desire uh, for what are the skill sets uh, that the labor that that industry is looking for and. And we can't have this disconnect. We have to be able to produce the, uh, produce the talent and the skill levels required for um, uh, students post-graduation uh, who become job seekers to easily get in to fill the positions that are required in the labor, you know, in, 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 in the labor market. So um, I think this, I think we need to have this continued dialogue with uh, both Niagara College and Brock University. How do we improve on the technology side? Um, how can the region assist in grant applications, right? For funding applications towards research and development. I mean, you know, we have, we have supported some of the research and development applications at higher levels of government. Um, and so we would, we would be pleased to continue to do that with our university and college. Uh, but how can we collaborate even further, right? With the industry in Niagara as well and the academic institutions to ensure that we're producing the labor force of the future that is required in Niagara. 
that is really the biggest question that is there. And I think no single person or no single department or region has actually the answer, but I think together we do. George, you had uh, mentioned previously the canal. So Marco, I'm going to move it over to you because I'm going to, uh, there have been quite a few questions when it comes to infrastructure specifically related to any type of transportation actually, because they provide high quality access to employment and they also can support economic growth. Um, George had mentioned the advantages that the canal offers uh, for industrial development and how it can be utilized. I think this is one of the questions that has come forward and we have seen a significant change there over the last couple of years. We now are looking at the canal, I think, differently uh, than just waving at the boats going by. We see it with different eyes. Um, this is one of the questions and maybe I'll start out there on the future of the, sure. of the canal holes. But uh, there's also a couple of questions that are related to the go train and some other areas of it. Fantastic. So as you stated, Mishka, I mean, you look at the canal and its history. We've had four canals in our history. They've, uh, they've all been a, a complement to people and goods movements. I think that is only now intensifying uh, in today's world. Uh, and, and especially through the, the Welland Canal as well is no different. So... When you look at that history and the fact that it is intensifying and we're looking at those and you know, having those conversations about potential short sea shipping strategies uh, and, and looking at a marine strategy in the future, how we can further be in, interconnected to the Canada and US ports. And, and, and you start to think about what's transpired in my last two years in, in the city of Thorold with the establishment of the Thorold Multimodal Hub. Just to provide maybe some of the viewers some context and some background there, there was a memorandum of understanding that was signed between uh, canal fronting municipalities and the Hamilton Oshawa Port Authority to develop these multimodal hub operations along canal fronting municipalities, not only in Thorold, but also in Port Colborne, Welland, and, and also St. Catharines being uh, another hub as well, essentially. So what's been important there is that normally you would have had maybe one large producing manufacturing firm on a site in the past. You, you would have had some of these, these operations that uh, were, were essentially, you know, once they were gone, they were gone. Now with the multimodal hub, they've created essentially what is an industrial park within a large 500,000 plus square foot facility. And that makes you that much more sustainable and nimble as you start to look at, you know, what does the future entail? Because if one of those businesses decides to leave the operation or leave that industrial park, essentially not everything fumbles, not everything crumbles. You still have those other businesses that are still going to be resilient and will attract others to the table as well. So just to provide an example, over 500,000 plus square feet at the multimodal hub, 100,000 square feet already taken up by Tora, who is warehousing GM engines. You have CME, Canadian Maritime Engineering with 30,000 square feet, emergency welding with 3,000 square feet, AP products. You have a tech company in there, which traditionally you wouldn't have had a tech company along the canal, but there is one there because as George mentioned before, there's access to a lot of power through Northland power and through some of the underground infrastructure that connects to Walker Industries as well. So you have all these new opportunities that are presenting themselves given the fact that we have a provincial and the federal level of government that is looking at new types of industries, clean tech industry that they want to see in response to some of our reliance on you know, resources that we no longer want to be uh, attached to. So you, know, you, look at, you look at clean tech, for instance, we've had two businesses already that have come forward to the multimodal hub to make a presentation to municipal and regional councils indicating that they have an interest. So Char Technologies has already leased a specific area of the multimodal hub. However, they're not in operation yet because they're going through their ministry approvals at this time, but they're really looking at creating a clean coal product, which essentially through their pyrolysis uh, process will create a product that can then be sold to ArcelorMittal de Fasco, be put into their blast furnaces and reduce their carbon footprint by 30%. And the reason why I bring that up is because there's an importance on environmental sustainability. And we can actually be that environmental steward right here in Niagara, and we're already starting to see that. So when we talk about what types of opportunities the canal can bring, it brings opportunity for us to transform not only our regional economy, our provincial economy, but also our federal economy, and make us that much more of a global player. 
Another example is Stormfisher, who has indicated they've had interest as well. And they're looking at a hydrogen project, which would be upwards of $250 million. Again, clean tech, renewable energy, tied to, again, the fact that we have the power sources, we have the skill sets, and we also have the industrial capacity to be able to accommodate them. So I think it's also important to note that our, our colleagues in St. Catharines have also taken a lead role in developing a marine strategy in partnership with Welland, with Thorold, with Port Colborne, with the Niagara Industrial Association, and taking that into consideration when we're looking at lobbying efforts at the provincial and federal levels of government, which we've seen some of the fruits of that labor in a sense, because they've established a marine secretariat, which we now hope will start to look at new incentives and new ways of doing business and new policy implementation that will allow the heddles, the heddle marines of the world and other shipbuilding, uh, other shipbuilding companies for their capacity to be able to compete at the global stage. So there is so much happening along the canal with regards to also people movement. Look at Port Colburn. Don't remember the last time I saw a cruise ship coming through, but now we have Viking cruise lines coming through the canal. And it's, you know, one of their itineraries bringing that bring a high profile clients through the canal, they're able to now see what's transpiring that change and that vision can be realized with even those people as well, because they may be entrepreneurs that are coming through that flight lock and may have never considered Niagara as an opportunity or an option for them. So now we can then start to establish maybe those relationships with them as well. Welland, you, I can't even tell you the amount of industrial capacity that we've seen in Welland as well. So, and again, this all has a complement to other tier two suppliers to the industry that may be within the region, but not necessarily canal fronting municipalities. So when we talk about what are the opportunities, what are the advantages, they are, they are, they are great. I think we're already starting to take advantage of those opportunities. It's just a question of keeping up those relationships with the individuals that are willing to make those investments. Because I can tell you those that have already made the investment are looking to continue to make even more investments along those canal fronting lands because they see that opportunity. And once you've established that relationship and that trust, because that's really what it comes down to. It comes down to relationships and trust and knowing that we have their back when it comes to policy development and when it comes to you know, just working with them and picking up that phone, then the sky is the limit at that point. And I think our economic development community across the region understands this and will be able to capitalize uh, uh, better than anybody else in the future. I couldn't agree with you more because it doesn't matter who we talk to uh, in which business sector is there, that I think there's even the movement that's having a marine strategy coming together with different partners that are coming together and advancing it has been really applauded by people across Niagara and especially businesses that are there and entrepreneurs at the same time. Marco, while I have you, if I can just for maybe a brief answer on what is coming forward on when we look at the gold train, um, this is one of the ones and the airport uh, situation too. But maybe if you can just touch base on when you look at your strategic plan or the 10 year plan that you have there, what are the opportunities when it comes to those two particular areas of it? Go train, what timeline are we looking at, looking at the 10 years, and uh, where do you see the future of the airport? Um, and especially probably the one in uh, located in um, Niagara on the Lake. Niagara on the Lake. Yeah, no, so well, having been, um, you, you know, I was essentially a, a, a huge, uh, I'm a huge advocate because it's a, it, it's, it's a big thing for me in the sense that I, I would like to see further traffic at that airport. So. Uh, having, you know, having been in St. Catharines and St. Catharines being one of the owners of the airport at this port shared ownership, obviously, with uh, Niagara Falls and Niagara on the Lake. Um, you know, it's incredible to see the $11 million worth of investment that's already been made there for complete security perimeter fencing, the 5,000 foot runway, the two 2,500 foot uh, taxiways, the 8,000 foot, 8,000 square foot terminal building, as well as the infrastructure that was put in on the southwest development area of the airport for MROs, so maintenance and repair organizations all in an effort to attract a daily flight. Uh, and we have Fly GTA Airways, which is obviously still, you know, doing what, doing what it is that they're doing and doing it very well. And, and, and being another further connector, connector, if you will, to the GTA, which we've also established within the plan as that, that is one of our top priorities is to establish, you know, those business connections with the GTA, because that's where we can actually facilitate that much faster. 
uh, and, and not necessarily have to go abroad internationally all the time because really those, those businesses are in our backyard in the GTA because they're actually running out of room. They're at a 1% to 5% sometimes vacancy rate in those areas. And therefore, all that, vac that vacancy, that number is actually pushing development our way naturally. Uh, but at the same time too, though, as you mentioned before, we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready for that development. So we need to have certain policies and procedures in place to be able to tackle that amount of traffic that we're actually seeing. And it will continue to come this way from there, from Brantford, from other areas where I know they're at capacity as well. And then you have, you know, uh, uh, you have the airport actually north of Toronto, uh, Buttonville Airport, which is actually going to be closing down at some point. And then some of those aircraft are going to have to shift somewhere as well. Uh, because Toronto Pearson is just looking at operating the heavies, if you will. So the 747s, the A380s, the 787s, they're looking at those heavier planes and international community that they want to accommodate. And, you know, some of those regional aircraft are, are going to need somewhere to go. So there is a potential capacity for us to take advantage of that as we continue to make further upgrades to the airport. Obviously, screening material, CBSA, and other issues will come to play when, when, that, when that happens or if that gets established. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, you look at that airport, and, and I see nothing but opportunity. I see nothing but opportunity in the sense that we still haven't fully realized its potential. Uh, and, and I think it can only get that much better in the future if we start to you know, plan through the implementation process that will be put in place after this strategy. Uh, that, that, that we start to tailor certain programs and opportunities to it. With regards to GO Train, you know, again, huge opportunities as well, not only from a residential intensification perspective, because you can see in Toronto and the GTA, Mississauga, Oakville, Burlington, you know, they have established residential areas around these stations. Uh, because it makes it that much easier for people movement uh, from an environmental perspective, less reliance on vehicles. Uh, so it makes sense from a planning perspective to have those areas, uh, you know, grow and develop in that way. Uh, but from an opportunity perspective, think about the skill sets. I mean, George touched upon this already. We already have an influx of people from the GTA and the Hamilton area coming this way. If we can establish an opportunity to capitalize on any of those individuals that might be entrepreneurial to open up businesses in the area or to make them aware of the different assets that are in place to help them establish themselves here. There's nothing but tremendous opportunity for us to capitalize in that regard. And that's only, and that's only one thing. There's many others as well that we could take advantage of too, but we could literally talk here all day about what those advantages could be from a go train and airport perspective. So I just wanted to give you a small tidbit there, if you will. Thank you very much. And um, I want to also uh, move on from the infrastructure conversation, transportation conversation, but we have one of our participants here who's asking a question and, and um, they're asking, currently there are hundreds of jobs and uh, thousands of tons of Canadian outbound inbound freight that are supported through the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation, real estate and tenants. How do we get additional regional support to develop these properties? Um, and, and Marco, maybe the answer to this one is, is there someone that this individual could get in touch with um, to maybe leverage us so that we can take the next 10 minutes on some other topics? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if they're looking to get in touch, uh, we're obviously the door is always open. Happy to facilitate in that regard and get them in touch with the appropriate people. Okay. Perfect. So um, thank you very much for that. I, uh, George, I'm coming back to you. Uh, in your report, you outlined uh, some of the feedback that you've gotten back from the business uh, consultations that have taken place and uh, areas that people have identified as being the region's top barriers. And the three that are part of your report and that are mentioned in there is that too many government leads, uh, too much government leads to an inefficient tiered system and added red tape leading to redundancy and duplication. The lack of affordable housing uh, with the rising cost of living in the region makes it challenging for lower income families. And the lack of diversity in the labor force and skill sets, which an aging population uh, and a mismatch of labor force. When I look at those top barriers, which were uh, identified by businesses in your consultations that um, that have taken place, you spoke to a little bit on the affordable housing. Uh, you've touched on the labor force. 
Um, but the one that was the number one identified was the uh, the system that we currently have. Do we have too much red tape, redundancy, decision making is sometimes slower than business wanted. We like fast decisions and quick decisions um, and responses that are there. How is your plan addressing some of those areas that have been identified by businesses? Yeah, and, and that was very important. One of the things I'm really proud of with our with our with our strategy was the outreach. Um, you know, we spent over 10 months really um trying to communicate with all all businesses small medium and large businesses the opportunity to to uh to engage with our local citizens as well and um to really get their input this is their plan right um this is their input we i, th I think we we were able to do that i think we were able to do that successfully we had over 500 respondents to our uh surveys questions and our uh, in-person engagements um, so that's one one thing that I think I'm, I'm very proud of in terms of the strategy. It was very important to me uh, that that we went out and we listened to the community, and I believe we did. And some of those key areas, uh, as you mentioned, and so, some of the feedback that we got, and I'll touch upon. You know, we, we've touched upon a number of things around affordable housing and labor force, but the one area also that was of concern was um, uh, too much red tape. Um, you know, too many layers, redundancy, et cetera. That's always a question for government. And I totally understand, you know, for I think one of the best things you can do for businesses and businesses to be able to thrive is to act as that facilitator, to act as that conduit, to be able to provide some expediting of, of, of services where when needed. And in fact, on, on our team here at the regional Lava, we do have um, we we do have a staff person that works directly with any business inquiries, any development uh, inquiries to help triage and facilitate that process through the system. Not just working at the regional level and getting through the uh, the triage of of approvals and permitting and things like that at the regional level, but also working with the local area municipalities as well. So I believe that is a, a, a really important area for us to address in economic development and how we can influence that. Um, I, I think you get a lot of that support at the local area level as well from the local area economic development offices um, where they're trying to work with the business community to facilitate any kind of expansions, investments and through a development process. But clearly it was identified as an area of concern. Um, we are a two-tiered government. Um, you know, we, we, we have, you know, regional policies, we have local policies. Um, I think in many, in many ways, uh, we, we, prior to me arriving, I know there was a KPMG that came in to do a whole analysis of sort of the services and whatnot. Um, and I think we're operating very efficiently according to their, uh, according to their analysis, but there's always rooms, always room for improvement. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, the more at times government can get out of the way in some of these processes or make it easier, make it more efficient, um, I think will improve any, any type of uh, services that businesses need and the business community needs from both regional, local levels of government. We also provide some facilitation to uh, access other levels of government, um, you know, at the provincial and federal level as well. So. We heard the community, we're addressing that, and it's one of the things that we want to continue to improve on as part of our 10-year strategy, uh, being able to provide efficient services, uh, cutting out some of that red tape, and reducing some of the time requirements that are involved in, in, uh, in, in processes um, uh, through building permit applications or development applications. And whatnot. We're, we'll do our best in economic development to help expedite that. You know, we hear this so often, but we want to recognize the uniqueness of the 12 municipalities that are there. There is such an opportunity at the same time to come together. And I think when we have looked at when Niagara succeeds, I mean, right now we're celebrating the Canada Summer Games, you know, right here because we've come together. Um, we recently, you know, approved the regional transit where we have come together. So when we even look at and marine strategy, like you talked about, Mark, but we've come together and we seem to be stronger when we don't compete against one another. Uh, and I think we have a greater sense or chance of success at different levels of government, provincially and federally, in our asks when we come together. 
Um, and that is always collaboration is always a challenge. Um, it's, it's it's difficult for all of us individually and corporations to do it. But I think NAGA has had quite a high number of examples now where it has worked really well. Um, and I think there's a lot of businesses that are supporting it uh, at the same time. Um, I'm conscious that we don't have much more time here, but I'm actually wanting to bring something up and that's likely on the, it's critical. Economic growth is what one person had said, does not mean anything unless it supports equity, diversity and uh, being inclusive. Um, and it was mentioned in your plan. It's something that so many organizations are struggling with right now, but so many organizations at the same time are committed to. When you look at your economic plan that you have in the strategies, what role does it play? What opportunities do you see when we're looking at EDI? Yeah, and, and very important question, uh, Mishka. And, and, and again, in our plan, we identified that, right? We, we need, we cannot afford to leave any communities behind and we, and we won't. Um, economic development, you know, our, our priority uh, through the plan will be to reach out to those, um, uh, to the communities um, um, to identify, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're, 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 we're making sure that we're, building the relationships in those communities. We're helping those uh, all the communities across Niagara. And it's very important for us to do that because oftentimes various areas, various communities may not have access to the services. So what's important for us is that through the plan, we identified that this is an area that we wanna be stronger in. Uh, we, have, we have our limited resources. We're not a very big office. But certainly, I think we can we can help build the bridge and help um, you know reaching out directly, working with our local area municipalities to ensure that we're not leaving leaving anyone behind. That access to services and opportunities are available for all communities across Niagara, and I think that's that, that's important. Uh, at a regional level, we're we're already engaging uh, with the indigenous community in Niagara and um, and looking to uh, to work with them to identify key areas of opportunities uh, that, that we can help build in various areas of the regional services, but uh, we're also working on some, on, on some economic development tools and opportunities uh, that can build and strengthen those relationships. Yeah, and I think we're actually all at the point where we're all learning from one another. Actually, we're seeing what other organizations are doing. I'm looking again at the Canada Summer Games. They have had a unique, interesting approach to it. And we're looking at a post-secondary embracing it too. I think we're all learning from each other um, as we're making this much more of a priority. I'm going to bring up, I'm going to take advantage of these last three minutes, actually, with a question that probably needs an hour or longer. It wants significantly more time, and that's climate change. The region recently held the climate summit uh, at Brock University with the recognition and coming out of it, and which I thought was uh, Chair Bradley actually at the end summarized it too, really recognizing that we likely lack behind other Ontario uh, municipality and some of the initiatives that we have and opportunities that we might have not taken advantage of. Um, what role does climate change play in your plan, and especially when we look at the world right now, or even Canada only, we mm -hmm. can see impact um, but how has it shaped your plan and again in our plan we wanted to make sure to address that right it's it's you know i think there will be other areas within the corporation that will have that lead responsibility if you will around climate change however economic development will be a player at, at in those discussions we want to be able to try to influence the importance of of, uh, of climate change and addressing that um, I think many companies, you know, I think I think there's been a lot of talk about climate change and how do we, do we reduce carbon emissions and get to the levels that we need to get to. Much discussion has been taking place over a num number of years. I think the time is now. I think we really need to, um, you know, ensure that um, government, uh, corporations and all are putting in place the effective tools and mechanisms um, to address healthier environment. Um, uh, those mechanisms required to reduce the carbon footprint. Um, in particular, you know, in Niagara, it is very important. Uh, you know, we went through an official plan process um, and, and, you know, the community really came out, lots of delegations at, at regional council about the importance of climate preserving our natural heritage and the environment. So 
these are areas we certainly wanted to ensure we're in the plan. We've identified that they're important for us. And I believe economic development will not necessarily have a leadership role to play in that, but certainly uh, we will be a catalyst to helping driving some of those initiatives forward uh, to, to, to better have the environmental strategy and the climate change action plan that's required that, as I said, at all levels, not just of government, but industry as well. Thank you so very much. I'm conscious of the time and we always promised people that we would stay within the hour and I want to keep that promise today as well. Although I have to say, I can imagine that this conversation could at least take another hour or two. There's so many other topics that I can think of actually looking at and exploring. So George and Marco, uh, thank you so very much for giving us this hour, for being with us and overall also for being so accessible to the business community and to people that are really wanting to reach out to connect more and that also need your support. So thank you for that. And to all of our participants, really glad that you were able to join us. We know uh, some of you have not been able, who have not been able to do so or would like to share this webinar. It has been recorded and will be available on our website at gncc.ca and will also be emailed to all participants directly. So lastly, thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you soon again, uh, either at one of our espressos or even better in person. Thank you. Thank you.